This podcast is produced by Linear B Group, the brand, content, and account-based marketing agency for the private capital industry. You're listening to Fun Shack. I'm Ross Butler, and today I'm speaking with Bernard Fairman, Executive Chairman of Foresight Group, a sustainability-led investment manager. Bernard co-founded Foresight in 1984, and in 2021 it listed on the London Stock Exchange. There's three main parts to the business, infrastructure, private equity, and Foresight Capital Management, and it manages listed investment companies, institutional LPs, and open-ended investment companies. Bernard, the first time we met was back in 2002 when I was a venture capital reporter and you kindly came to see me up in the Millbank Tower. And it stuck in my mind because you mentioned to me at the time that your latest VCT was the best performer by a country mile. I think it might even have already been investing in some forms of uh, alternative energy back then. Foresight Group's come a long way since then. You listed a couple of years ago on the London Stock Exchange to what extent does the direction and trajectory of your success kind of, you know, surprise you? Or was it all in the plan even back then? Well, it's never all in the plan, is it? I mean, um, you look at the world in front of you and try to figure out what is the best strategy. What what I think has um, got us to where we are today is having um, good strategies. Mm. Um, for a long time, we pursued a losing strategy that no one wanted, namely venture capital. No one in the UK wanted anyway. It's changed a bit now, but not a lot. Go to the West Coast still, yeah. frankly. Mm. And, and back in those days, in the 80s, uh, uh, when we started, we spent a lot of time on the West Coast. And at that point, you were able to talk to the people that whose names were on the doors still, the Don Valentines of this world uh, and the Tom Perkins. Um, things have changed a bit since then, and they've grown a lot, a lot bigger. Um, But we carried on with venture capital uh, far too long and didn't see that the world was changing. Um, Except that after 2000, uh, we got the boom and the bust in tech. um, And I started looking at um, how we could move from an area where we couldn't raise any money to an area where we could. And so after a few years, we ended up with what I call renewable energy infrastructure. And I think I was one of the first, if not the first in the UK to use that phrase. Uh, and indeed to um, sort of build an asset class. Uh, why did I do that? Well, it, it was at the time people were talking about clean tech. I needed a bridge from tech to something that people wanted to invest in. Clean tech provided the, the bridge. Um, it, in fact, it wasn't the latest fuel cell technology. It was a solar farm or, or equivalent. And indeed, we were the um, first in the UK to start investing in, in solar in 2007 eight. We got into that area not because of some kind of quasi-religious conviction, um, but because we could see that that um, solar in particular will be the cheapest form of energy generation. Uh, reason being, um, it's subject to Moore's law. The, the cost of a semiconductor goes down by every 18 months by 25% compound in perpetuity. And indeed, we've seen that. Uh, uh, and it's an amusing aside. I saw in the paper the other day, the Chinese solar panels are now so cheap, largely because they're hugely um, subsidised, but they're so cheap that farmers in some countries are using them for fences. <laughs> so that's where we've got. Mm. Um, but we saw that, um, we foresaw that, uh, to coin a phrase, back in 2005, five six. And uh, our vision then was, or my vision then, was that um, solar will be the f- cheapest form of energy generation. So it is proving. Um, now I think what we're looking quite hard at hydrogen as the next um, step in the mm. de-electrification of, of uh, the world. Mm. I think when it came to uh, venture capital, we really morphed into, again, something that people wanted to buy, which is private equity. Our strategy was basically to to do what uh, 3i used to do back in the day when it used to be called ICFC, and indeed when I used to work there, which was to be a um, a regional private equity player uh, in every major town in the UK. You had your bank, um, um, if you wanted to borrow something, and you had... ICFC or 3I if you wanted to um, raise equity. Um, And now, indeed, we're one of the two largest um, regional private equity players in the UK. And we did that by figuring out that, um, firstly, there was a need, a wide open goal as 3I had left the market. Secondly, the way to finance it was to go to local authority pension funds in the regions and say to them, look, do you you want to put some money into something that will invest in your region Uh and create jobs in your region? Um, and generate wealth in your region. Mm. Um, and that was a winning strategy. Mm. 
um, which means that we've raised money now from most, I probably shouldn't say all because I'm not sure it is, but most, if not all, of the um, local authority pension funds in the UK. Through which kind of vehicles? They're limited partnerships. Mm. Um, so they're, uh, in the main, they're LPGP um, type structures. Mm. Um, indeed, although, as you, as you kindly mentioned earlier, we have raised money in investment trusts, the serious money in the years going forward, this year and, and next, certainly, will be LPGP funds. Because as we're in um, the infrastructure space, yeah, in, in a kind of arms race type situation where the biggest will win, mm. um, we've got to raise lots of money quite quickly. And uh, last year was a bit of a, a write-off in that respect. The, um, uh, the, the checkbooks of the uh, LPs remained um, resolutely shut. Mm. This year, however, is different. So I hope we'll, we'll begin to see some significant money flowing into the coffers. Uh, we've never been short of deals. We're always short of money, however much money we've got. Mm. That remains the case. Yeah, so I did. I did notice uh, that your strategy it kind of spans from this regional private equity, regional UK private equity pr- approach, right through to kind of what looks like almost a global infrastructure play, and these yeah. seem quite different. What what connects the two? Uh, well, that's an interesting point. Um, my, I, I, the answer is on the service, not much, uh, other than private equity was our original business. Uh, but in reality, increasingly in infrastructure, we're seeing deals that need private equity skill sets. Uh, and private equity and infrastructure are converging to some extent. Mm. And so you, you've seen quite a lot of um, big operations. I mean, I, I, I'm mindful of people like EQT and Partners Group, that they've got both skill sets, both uh, disciplines within their businesses. And, and I, I think we'll continue to do that and we'll continue to grow both. It seems like a very competitive area, the infrastructure part of the world. Prices are high. How do you um, find differentiated opportunities that you can get a decent return out of in that area? I'm going to apologise for slightly disagreeing with you on that. Um... Please. Our sponsor for this episode is RW Blears, a UK law firm specialising in venture and growth capital. RW Blears works for a range of institutional and emerging fund managers with a particular focus on GBLP funds, EIS, IHT and VCT funds. Clients of the firm include Foresight, Calculus, Downing, Moulton Ventures, Ascension, and Deepbridge. I'm at their offices in London's trendy Farringdon district with Frank Daly and Ollie Blears, who head up their funds practice. Ollie, we met recently, and I'm delighted to be here to ask you a few questions about what makes RW Blears different. Likewise, it's a pleasure to be Funchak's first sponsor. I was a fan uh, for a few months before we fortuitously ran into each other. So, so we're somewhat of a specialised firm. We've got uh, between us a cross expertise of corporate tax and, and regulatory knowledge with a particular focus on advising fund managers in the setup, launch and deployment of their fund strategies. Frank, how long have you been at the firm? Uh, I think I'm the longest serving member apart from the senior partner who founded it. Uh, so I've been here 14 years and I think since day one uh, what I've really focused on is EIS and VCT funds. So you know that market backwards, do you need to be a specialist to do that? Yeah I think you do because um, we've seen occasionally big firms sort of dip their toe into these uh, areas and uh, while the rules are sort of self-contained they have been fiddled with ad nauseum ever since they were conceived in 1995 I think it was and there was the forerunner scheme before that so it's an area that if you're not a specialist I think you can easily come a cropper in uh, with costly consequences for, for investors so I think it really is important. What about on the uh, the institutional fundraising side, Ollie? How have you found things? Because it's been a difficult market for the last year or 18 months or so. I spend a lot of time with emerging fund managers, so those who are managing either their first fund all the way up to fund three. And last year was pretty torrid. So there was a, a deep freeze that took place throughout the course of the year. Uh, a number of mandates we had lost uh, lead investors or just sort of went into complete stasis. To start of this year, uh, some seedlings, which is great. So a lot of inbound interest uh, on new fund formations. Uh, I think year on year, there's a real appetite to begin fundraising again. Uh, well, we're in um, renewable energy. We're not investing it by and large in the latest airport or, or road or, or whatever. We've got a bit of that, but that's not our main effort. Our main effort is renewable energy. Mm. Um, the world is decarbonising at a rate driven largely by economics, but partly by politics. Um, and uh, I think that there's more deals to be done than there is money to invest in them. Mm. Uh, for example, we, we've done a number of, of, of uh, what I could describe as um, rollout deals, where platform deals, perhaps a better word, where y- y- you, know, you invest in one and there are six more to do. 
And right now, if you look at what we've got rights to do, uh, but right now I don't have the money for it, it's well in excess of five billion. Returns of, um, a, a quite in a quite narrow band. I mean, um, I've never seen an infra deal done at less than 5% IRR uh, or at, um, I mean, a proper infra deal at more than about 10%. Mm. So it isn't like it varies in enormous, uh, um, you know, in, in enormous swings. So can you give me an example of, of one of the, either on the private equity or the infrastructure side? Because, I mean, you've mentioned hydrogen already, but it, but it seems to me like, you know, solar energy and wind farms, these aren't new technologies. These are, in fact, quite old technologies. Mm-hmm. So where's the opportunity you're seeing? Um, so I agree with you. So uh, the opportunity is if the world is going to decarbonize uh, anytime soon, we've got to roll out literally trillions of um, uh, of pounds, dollars, euros of um, backbone energy generation. Our contention is that solar will be the, the backbone energy generator. There'll be wind and all the rest of it, uh, but solar will be the one that will win because purely on cost competitiveness. So it, it, I think it, it's not a function of making, you know, super returns. If you want to do that, then you you take super risks. A- and uh, the opportunity is there right in front of us. Mm. Um, I- I've told you about five billions worth of deals that we've got uh, right now um, that we could do tomorrow if we had the money, which we don't, which is why we're raising some more money now. So there's uh, still a massive opportunity there's a massive o- solar, I think solar energy. Well, there's a massive opportunity for solar energy. The massive opportunity for the energy transition is just a mm. Massive opportunity. I've been in the private equity space now for uh, since 1980. It's, it's way bigger uh, than any other thing I've ever seen in my investment career. Mm. I mean, it, it is literally a multi-trillion a year opportunity. That's right, yeah. And what about, so you've never been into wind? Yes, we've got about, off the top of my head, a couple of billion pounds invested into in wind. A wind is part of the energy mix. Um, I don't think it's going to be a long-term you know, major player. It, it, it was probably the original renewable energy infrastructure uh, category um, before solar beca- became as, as important as it is now. And in fact, in the UK, it's still way more important than solar. But there isn't the cost driver that you see with solar. Uh, uh, you know, it's steel and, and concrete. There's a limit below which um, right. costs won't be driven down. Yeah. And therefore, energy generation costs won't go down below a certain price. Uh, of course, yeah. I mean, it's not your job to construct an entirely coherent energy system, but I suppose you do have to take into account where it sits in an energy mm-hmm. system. And there's obviously a large intermittency problem with something mm-hmm. like solar. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't seem to worry you. Still seem to, you still think that solar is going to be the big play of the next decade or so. I think solar is going to be the major player. Uh, but but I, I think we've left a world where there's one big central energy provider uh, um, located uh, uh, you know, miles away from users. Uh, um, and I think that the intermittency point will be dealt with, in our uh, minds anyway, largely by, um, I mean, batteries and all the rest of it, fine, but batteries aren't the answer. Uh, the answer may well be hydrogen, which is why we're currently raising a hydrogen um, mm. LPGP fund. Okay, so I'd like to talk a bit about hydrogen, because on the one hand, I could flippantly say that you've ridden the renewable energy wave, but actually as a marketeer, what it seems to me that you've done is you've created a, a category and then you've become the leader in it, which is actually pretty unusual. You were a very early mover in this. You saw it coming. You, you predicted, let's say, the application of Moore's law. What's the, what's the story in, behind your conviction in hydrogen? Everybody knows um, what hydrogen does. Um, but hydrogen won't happen and couldn't happen because of its cost uh, without renewables and without, if you will, surplus renewables, um, zero cost of production surplus renewables. Zero cost of production surplus renewables means that you can make hydrogen economically. Um, but there are other, uh, you know, things that you see. I mean, I've got no uh, a great insight into this, but I just picking up the paper the other day, I mean, Toyota have now come up with a, a, a car um, where they basically have an electrolyzer in a tank, which you fill with distilled water. It electrolyzes on the spot. Uh, and um, y- you've got a hydrogen fuel cell car. Now that uh, if, if that's ever put into production, which uh, it may well be, um, that's a um, that's a game changer. And I think we're going to see a, a, a lot of that around. But the the basic reason for why hydrogen is beginning to work economically is because of surplus zero cost of production renewables. 
But is there surplus zero cost of production renewables in Europe, for example? Uh, that, yeah, I mean, uh, the answer is you, you, you get. We've seen w w with um, the battery funds, which have, have suffered rather recently, um, you get wild swings because either you're producing huge amounts and the grid can't take it, or there's a big shortfall. Mm. And if you're producing huge amounts, um, you know, y y y you've got a, a, a problem because what are you going to do with the surplus energy, mm. uh, which is where hydrogen comes in. Because it it's opinion. an energy vector, so you can store that energy once you you've turned it. it into hydrogen. You can. Right. And hydrogen infra is um, something where you can invest now, and we have invested. We've invested in Germany and in northwestern uh, UK. Right. Uh, uh, right now, I mean, you can only invest in anything that makes sense with a bit of government assistance. Mm. And in Germany, there's lots of government assistance, and the, the logic for that is that... Um, Germany got it wrong uh, in terms of its energy mix, as mm. we all know. German um, uh, pro, pro desire for, for cheap gas from Russia didn't work out well, did it really? Mm. Um, and they closed all their nuclear down, so they needed a new something new quite quickly, mm. which is why there, there's good um, subsidies. I mean, that's an interesting point, actually, because my view generally is that government... Um, Governments get in the way. I mean, there is no, as far as I'm aware, government energy policy, or there isn't a coherent one that I'm aware of in the UK uh, and in most other places. There's no government energy policy, you'd say? And no coherent <coughs> government energy policy. Hmm. I mean, you tell me what the government energy policy Net is. Net zero of some yeah. sort. Well, exactly. I think that's probably right. I mean, if you say it will happen, it will automatically happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's have lots of electric cars. Oh, dear, we haven't got a charging network. Hmm. Uh, or, or, oh dear, we do have a charging network, but someone stumbles up in the middle of the night and um, you have to pay by phone and there's no cellular network where mm. the charging point is. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, well, it hasn't been thought through. I wasn't going to bring this up, but, you know, I'm if we can have hydrogen fuel cars, you know, brilliant. But for me, the diesel engine powered the modern world and the modern diesel engine is a marvel of efficiency and cleanliness, really, relative to yeah. anything else out there. And yet it's effectively uninvestable because yeah. of the way we categorise things. I agree. Uh, and um, to, to reiterate, we've always only invested in, in things for economic reasons. Um, and hydrogen will win and do its bit in the energy transition only as a function of, of um, cost reductions going forward. You need to see significant cost reductions. I was going to mention that the governments normally get in the way, but with um, solar, that they were very material in making it happen. Mm. Because uh, feeding tariffs followed by rocks in this country and enabled an in the industry to scale. Mm. And it's all, it was all about scale. I mean, most of um, the renewable energy industry is about scale. If you want to get cost down, you've got to be big, which is why I was talking about us seeking right. to expand quite rapidly in that space. Well, the Germans were pretty proactive in solar as well. Earlier, they were, they? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were. They, 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 they were ahead, of, I think, probably of um, everywhere else in Europe. But, you know, now the, the there are no... <coughs> solar cells manufactured in Germany has been wiped out by uh, the Chinese. Um, oh. and hence my earlier comment about farmers using solar uh, panels as, uh, as fencing. It's so cheap, you can't yeah. compete. Yeah, so you're not a policymaker, but were you able to influence policy? Would you have a policy that you would recommend that would make sense for Europe and for you as an investor and for the European citizen with regards to renewable energy? Yeah, I mean, I think I try to set out what will be the main forms of energy generation, what the government framework of support will be for that uh, uh, energy generation, uh, and set it in, in concrete for the next 10 years. Right, uh, so uh, certainty is the important. Certainty is really important, but i tell you the other thing that's really important. Another thing that politicians seem, and I've seen it close, close up, they think that they say something and, and next week it happens. If you say you're going to have an energy transition, that's fine, and we're having an energy transition, but it's a 30-year... Event, it's not a three-minute event or even a three-year event, mm. which means we need um, hydrocarbons uh, as much now as we've always done, and we'll do for years to come. Mm. And what will drive the transition isn't fine words from politicians; uh, it's economics. Mm. And so, you know, all of the pressure groups will get their wishes not because of pressure, but because of people want to buy stuff because it's cheaper or more efficient. Uh, and the good news is that will happen, has happened in solar, and will begin to happen in a whole lot of other stuff as well. In all of this, I haven't actually asked your view on electric vehicles. Where do you stand on that? I think it's a transition technology. Right. Uh, I, I think it's going down, down a, a blind alley, which um, will peter out in maybe five or ten years' time. That quickly? 
Uh, I like think the so. mini disc. Yeah, I think so. That's my. That's why. Well, mm. there is no um, charging infrastructure of any note in this country. I mean, mm. there is one, but it's a. If you fancy driving long distance, I wouldn't. One question. Second question: What do you do with the old batteries? Third question: How do you deal with the um, repair and insurance and uh, uh, life cycle costs generally of, uh, of mm. secondhand values? Oh yeah, uh, all of those things uh, no one's thought through. And, and fourth question: Do you really want your car industry to be wiped out and we import all our cars from China? Uh, if you can answer all those four questions, then I'll, I'll, I'll revisit my my opinion. But um, well, I also saw a quite worrying policy paper. Um, by a consultancy the other day that basically said if we're going to electrify everything and everyone's going to be driving electric vehicles, we need to be introducing effectively load shedding, South African style, so that people can choose whether they can charge their car or have the fridge on, which didn't seem to me like truly uh, progressive uh, option. Uh, uh, the point about over an over-fast transition, faster than we can do it, is that the people that will suffer are, are those with least. Hmm. It, it's very, very, very regressive, and that hmm. is um, not a policy that I'd want to pursue. Renewable energy, you almost invented the category, but now everyone is on that bandwagon. It must be an incredibly um, competitive landscape. Where, where do you distinguish yourself? Where's your differentiators? What's your competitive edge? Well, firstly, I think there's enough for everybody. Right. Uh, um, but our competitive advantage um, is that... that, that we're one of the biggest in terms of size. We've got 150 people addressing this. We've got offices um, now, a couple of offices in Western Europe, in Madrid and, and, and in Rome, and uh, we're now quite big in Australia as a result of an acquisition we made um, a year or so ago. In our 150 people, we've got engineers and we've got accountants and we're offering a soup to nuts service. Mm. So we don't subcontract out the, um, the kind of business running of, of a solar park, as many other people do. We don't rely on third parties to to um, you know work. We we've got owners, engineers, if you will, um, that work for us mm. when stuff's being built. Um, when things go wrong, we, we've got our own people that that can identify that. And in right. Australia, actually, we've got people that um, operate stuff uh, like hydro plants. Um, so it's a mix of people that are addressing the issues, not only investment but also technical issues that yeah. arise from these these. Uh, um, investments that you make. So that's the very modern operational private equity approach rather than the merely kind of do the deal and then try and find an exit. I think those days are long gone. Yeah. If you if we revert a little bit now to our um, private equity business, I mean, yeah. when I um, got, started working for 3i in 1980, there was an element of uh, if you if you turned up every month for a, for a board meeting, you, you were super kind of um, um, careful. Uh, uh, normally, you, you just went every three months. <laughs> and and that, that is long gone. Many, many of our, of our portfolio, we've got a portfolio now of 250 and 50 actual investors. What's it like doing private equity deals in the UK regions at the moment? How would you describe the opportunity set? Not very competitive. How? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we're doing deals three, four, five, seven, maybe up to 10 million. The world needs dogs in the, I want to do 50 to 100 million or, or, or 200 million deals. And I might do one or two a year. I mean, we're doing um, probably 30 to 50 a year. It's a very different approach. Why um, aren't people competing with you in that sector? Are there structural reasons? Well, you've got to have a, a physical presence in the areas where yeah. you're uh, investing. Yeah. And we've got offices, you know, literally all over the country. I mean, it's hard to figure out a major conurbation where we don't have an office. Right. And we've got local people in those offices. Um, so it really is kind of the old 3i it, it was meant to be the old, the, the, but then three I didn't <clears throat> pull back from that model. It was a very stupid thing to do, in my opinion. I, I mean, a major mistake. We want to be, and the one thing the good that came out of that was three I infrastructure, which is a great business. But um, you know, the idea that you could, you had something that that, that had been embedded in the UK since since the the war, um, and you just throw it away because you wanted to become a major buyout shop, mm. and now they aren't. <laughs> um, it was was um, you know it was crazy, but um, but there you go. Everybody's got their own approach to these things. But you are doing kind of growth private equity deals in the regions. What you know? What's the kind of risk profile of those deals? What, what's your expectation in terms of what's going to go wrong and what's going quite, to quite low risk? I mean, what what, what goes wrong? Uh, I mean, it might be, I don't know, it might be a, um, a, an electrical distributor in 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 the Cambridgeshire area, for example. Hmm. Um, and they might be turning over, say, I don't know, five million and making a few hundred thousand when we invest. And what, what we're basically doing is um, 
because of the network that we've got, we're investing locally, um, then expanding the business, at, but then selling internationally. Uh, and once or twice, we do come across some real huge winners, sometimes in, in, in unexpected quarters. But fun enough, uh, and contrary to um, perhaps some people's prejudices, we're, we're doing good deals in Scotland as well. Hmm. Uh, raised money there both from um, local authority pension funds, but also from the Scottish government, which has been quite um, helpful and forward-looking in their approach. But we're, we're you know, li literally all over the place. I mean, the only... Um, uh, and we just opened an office in Wales, for example. Again, I mean, I think two or three deals have been done already. So it, the fact is, if you've got a um, hinterland, um, which the UK does, of literally hundreds of thousands of small businesses, mm. in due course, people want to retire. Mm. It, it, in most cases, no one's bothered with um, sales and marketing, uh, and you're just mm. selling to your mates, as you always have done. Mm. It's the story that, we, you know, we got taught at um, ICFC, as it then was, all those years ago, and it remains yeah. good even today. And at some point, we'll export the um, formula to um, continental Europe. Right. Uh, we looked at an, uh, an acquisition in, in France, for example. but um, Of an investment management company. Uh, of an investment management company that's got this regional network mm. with regional right. connections. I mean, from remember, they even had a, a, a 50 million uh, wine fund down in Bordeaux. I mean, that's pretty difficult. That's the ultimate walled garden almost. Probably Absolutely. literally, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I, I think it's a um, um, it's a very good area. I say, I can't ever see the demand not being there for for um, because people retire and uh, you know opportunities yeah. come up. Um, we've not mentioned foresight capital management. I'm not yeah. exactly sure what part of the business that is. Could you? A few years ago, we could see that. Firstly, we've got forty thousand retail investors. It, it, I haven't mentioned, but we're approximately one third retail, two thirds institutional. Um, we've got 40,000 private investors. So a few years ago, there was you couldn't get any money on, on deposit um, on the one hand. But on the other hand, we were investing in these fairly safe businesses, namely renewable energy businesses, that were generating 5 6% um, yields. Um, uh, and uh, the idea came to me to put the two together. And so... Um, Based on our quite deep knowledge of the renewable energy market, uh, we said to ourselves, well, if we put together some open-ended investment company structures and invest in, in, in a portfolio of, in the UK, in many cases competitors, but listed companies, um, listed wind companies and solar businesses and a variety of others, um, then we'd pass through what they were paying as dividends, which was generally, they started at six, um, so we could pass through five to our investors. Um, that expanded to um, an, a second fund, which covers the whole world. Um, and so uh, we're investing in listed in a portfolio of listed businesses, but in a space we understand and have deep knowledge of, um, and passing through, um, you know, the yield to, to investors. It's, it's an income um, income opportunity. Inevitably, over the last couple of years, the amount of money we're managing there has gone down because you're talking about long duration assets. And in rising interest rate environment, long yeah. duration assets uh, tend to be out of favour. Mm. Uh, and that's what's happened. But I expect that they come back big time when the um, interest rates start coming down. Um, and, and that isn't a, you know, it's not, it's not a huge operator. It's about eight people. Right. So out of 400, it's, it's a fairly small part. But, but you know, a useful contributor. Um, and I think that will, as I say, turn around and be, become even more useful um, over the next year or so. So you listed Foresight Group back in 2021. Yeah. How's that going? How's that changed things, first of all? Well, there are two uh, elements that, that I was seeking to achieve. Firstly was much higher visibility. I was, we didn't want to be a well-kept secret because if you go to a big institutional investor and they never heard of you, mm. then um, you've lost the battle before you started uh, the war. It's worked brilliantly in, in that respect. Uh, and also, uh, by the way, being in the Shard has been very helpful. Mm. because people have wanted to come and see us, whoever they are. That still remains the case. I mean, one might wish it weren't the case in some some of the, the small VCTs, some of their AGMs. You've got a lot of um, people <laughs> yeah. turning up. But, uh, Eating but your they, biscuits. They're tea and biscuits, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but there you go. The second um, uh, reason has worked not at all, which was to, to have the stock as, use the stock as an acquisition uh, um, um, currency. Um, and that has... Uh, um, just not worked because the the London market has been uh, everybody knows it, it the, the liquidity in the London market is 
tiny and getting worse. Um, and we're valued now at about seven times forward, which is, uh, given that we're growing at 25% compound, is a fairly silly number. Um, and so uh, right now we're not making acquisitions using stock because we it, they would be enormously okay. earnings dilutive. Yeah. If you look at the um, private markets in our space, they're probably selling at 15 times. Public markets are selling at half that in the UK. Our sponsor for this episode is RW Blizz. It's been a difficult market for transactions as well, but how do you feel about this vintage? And will we look back on it and think it, it was actually a good one? Feels that way, doesn't it? Um, venture capital's insulated from some of the complexities which I think PE equivalents face in terms of uh, leverage in the portfolio and valuation uh, as between buyers and sellers because VCs aren't taking control. So some of our clients have been very active throughout the past 18 months and that might be quite a savvy play a few years from now. Uh, others have been a lot more selective and anecdotally we're definitely hearing of uh, deals getting killed a bit more often uh, final investment committee. How has your business been affected thus far? We fortunately haven't felt the same level of impact as, as I think others would, partly because of our, our focus on the tax efficient funds, which sort of buck the trend quite often. If there's a general downturn in fundraising, the fact that they are able to offer those generous tax reliefs, which are such an important sort of tax planning element. We sort of operate sometimes in a sort of a slipstream from the main fundraising market for, for venture capital funds. So, you know, people keep raising and deploying capital through those schemes. The, the ups and downs are, are massively smoothed out. And obviously it fuels the next stage of VC investing, uh, where the, the VC and the US funds exit and there are, you know, bigger players come in. So, so it, it's a great feeder. What's the one thing that you would look for in a legal advisor if you were a client? What I think we do really well is that we are that one stop solution. What I've found and what I think clients really enjoy and respect is that it's me at the start and it's me at the end rather than getting bounced around departments. We can offer that because we, I guess, are specialists in that with, with the corporate tax and regulatory know-how, we can provide all of that um, through a single funnel, which isn't necessarily true of, of larger firms. So if I buy Foresight Group, I'm obviously buying the future potential of the business. You've alluded to it already to some degree, but what's the strategy going forward? Well, the strategy going forward basically is to continue down the route that we're going in terms of um, significantly expanding our, our infra business. Our infra business right now is about 10 billion. It needs to be 20, 25 billion pretty quick um, in two or three years. Uh, I mean, at, at that point, um, you find gross margins starting to go up as well, which obviously is important um, yep. for investors. And, and as I've said earlier, the opportunity is enormous. Um, I mean, we could deploy money at a far faster rate that, that, than we're currently raising it, or even that I could perceive that we could raise it. And so at some point, we'll need to um, you know, enter into some kind of liaison with someone that can help us. I, I've described it in the press as a big brother. It will give us access to money, that that, or, yeah, yeah. or it will yeah. be either directly or, or or via some kind of distribution deal. I mean, there are yeah. plenty of models around. I think the PE business will um, probably can probably double from its current size, the regional PE business. Um, but at some point, then we need to look at overseas markets. As I said earlier, yeah. export the formula. Uh, I mean, for example, we've got sixty odd people located in two offices in um, Australia. Um, and so that's something we could um, we could look at exporting to the Australian market. Although I have to say, I mean, the important th uh, thing is that we um, raise money locally first. We don't kind of go into mm. region and, and and spend UK money. It does seem a slightly ris risky prospect an international expansion of a private equity business. But I guess the yeah that gating option of raising local money is a kind of a some something of a risk mitigant it's it, credentials it, yeah. when you go in i guess well i recall back in the day that 3i had a um an excellent business in italy for example an excellent pe business in italy hmm. um i mean people don't realize the amount of private money in italy in particular is vastly more than it is in the uk i, I think i saw an, an, a four times higher per, per uh, private savings in, in in um italy than there is in the uk so you know, there are other markets out there with interesting dynamics. Uh, uh, we're not in the business of, you know, just going in, opening an office and hoping for the best. Uh, we'll only do that if we can raise local money before we start. Then we totally uh, uh, mitigate the risk because we've got a formula which we know works well. We hire local people. We support them from London. 
Um, and, um, uh, you know, that's the formula which has worked for us. Well, it sounds like there's a huge amount to play for. I wish you, the, you know, the best of luck with uh, with the future. I look forward to tracking it and maybe you can come in again another time. So we... Next time I'll be able to find it a bit quicker than I did this time. <laughs> thank you very much. You've been listening to the Fun Shack Private Capital Podcast. Now do me a favour, would you, wherever you're listening or watching, make sure you subscribe. It really helps and I'd appreciate it. Fun Shack is another quality production of Linear B Group, the content and media provider for professional services and investment firms. Thanks for listening.